I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with Betsy Campbell, the Chief Engagement Officer at Resolve, a National Infertility Association. Resolve was established in 1974, and it's an organization dedicated to helping people realize their goal of building a family. Betsy joins me to discuss the recent decision out of the Alabama Supreme Court, which ruled that frozen embryos created during fertility treatments should be considered children. And because of the decision to grant embryos personhood status, IVF in Alabama was effectively banned. Betsy and I discussed the far-reaching implications of that decision and the potential unknowns, both legal and otherwise, of how this decision could affect other areas of reproductive health care. We also talk about what states should be on our radar in relation to IVF and what you can do in your state to protect access to infertility treatments and IVF. We're really at an inflection point here in the reproductive justice landscape and granting embryos personhood status is a very dangerous direction. So here is my conversation with Betsy Campbell of Resolve. Betsy Campbell, welcome. Thank you for having me. So over the past couple of weeks, the topic that's dominated the the headlines and the political discourse in relation to reproductive rights, it hasn't been abortion, but it's been IVF, right? In vitro fertilization. And this, of course, is due to this ruling that came out of Alabama that effectively granted frozen embryos personhood. And, And the consequences of that decision effectively banned IVF in that state. But if you've been paying attention to the language conservatives specifically have been using in relation to reproductive rights, this leap from banning abortion to banning IVF, it wasn't really a leap at all. But before we dig into that decision, I want to talk about the case that brought this decision to to bear, right? The case in Alabama. Do you know much about that case? Sure. I'll try to explain it. And of course, we are sad for the couples who did lose their embryos in an accident in the place where their embryos were being stored. It was actually the IVF clinic is part of a hospital and a random uh, hospital patient walked into the place where the frozen embryos are stored and actually walked up to the tank. Uh, opened the lid, picked up a pipette that included the embryos, these microscopic embryos, and the pipette was completely frozen and kind of burned the person's hands. They dropped it, and then the embryos were no longer uh, viable. And so the three families impacted filed uh, a lawsuit uh, for negligence, but also for wrongful death. And it's that wrongful death claim that was heard by a lower court and dismissed and then went up to the Supreme Court, who actually said frozen embryos are the same as unborn children. Right. Now, there's an irony there, a really sad irony, right? Those families were probably devastated. You know, anyone who's going through IVF, you know, that it's a really precarious process and you may only have one shot to get those embryos. So I'm sure that they were devastated. Um, But were these couples, did they initially have the idea to do the wrongful death lawsuit or was there something cooking already in that state to take us in this direction of where we are now, where embryos were declared as having personhood, which is the only way that you can you know, file a wrongful death lawsuit with an embryo. I'm not aware of any activity specific to this case, although our community has been very concerned with the overturning of Roe that IVF could be next on the target list after abortion. So while this ruling is shocking, in some ways it's not surprising. So what was it about the Dobbs decision that clued you in that IVF was next? Because people are saying the same thing about birth control. Is it is it the language? Is it the use of the word like personhood or what was it? Right. So the issue is with personhood language. So personhood states that life begins at fertilization. So that is giving rights and personhood to a fertilized egg, all otherwise known as an embryo. 
so that's why uh, personhood can be applied to fertility treatments in a negative way and impact the ability to handle embryos, which is part of modern fertility care. And people forget that fertilized eggs and, and embryos are microscopic cells. You cannot even see them with the naked eye. And now they are being treated the same as born children, which is not in line with anything that we know about reproductive health care and science. If you had asked me, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, would we be in this place where personhood would be applied to an embryo? I would have said that's, that's insane. Like we're not going in that direction because personhood and thinking about embryos in the context of personhood was considered a really, really dangerous and extreme position, right? But here we are and this chief justice, chief justice, I think Tom Parker was the person who, you know, cited, I think the Bible in reference to this decision talked about embryos in that context. But IVF is a medical process. It's a scientific process. It isn't, it isn't magic, right? Right. Um, right. Yeah, but, but once you take it outside of the realm of, of science and you're making these arguments based on the Bible, anything is then on the table in relation to this. Exactly. Right. The goal of IVF is to have a healthy pregnancy with a single baby, and that requires creating enough embryos to give the best chance at pregnancy. And even with natural uh, fertility, without medical assistance, most embryos do not develop. And that is true in the laboratory as well. But if you're giving embryos the same rights as living people, and that embryo does not develop, will this now be considered wrongful death, manslaughter, or murder? And this is what everyone is now struggling with in Alabama, and that's why clinics have closed in the wake of this Supreme Court ruling. I mean, this can go in all sorts of directions. You know, one of the things that couples do when they're trying to find an IVF clinic is they look at the statistics, right? The the rates of success coming out of those clinics, right? If a right. couple goes to a clinic and this doctor is less successful than they'd want, they didn't quite get the embryos transferred correctly, and, and the couple was not happy with the, the outcome, are those doctors, could, could they be held responsible for mishandling an embryo? I mean, I'm not a doctor, but I can think of a dozen different scenarios where you know, people can be blamed. Right. The concern is that it would raise the potential for litigation and unnecessary lawsuits. And also, what about the intended parents, the patients who make a decision to freeze their embryos. I'm not aware of people being allowed to freeze their children. So, <laughs> you know, there's just a lot of what ifs that can't be answered. So what's happening right now in Alabama? I know things are moving really quickly, but I did read that the, the clinics in Alabama were trying to transfer those embryos of, of couples who were mid-treatment outside of the state, which again is an irony because that puts those embryos at risk, like moving an embryo from one environment to the other puts them at greater risk, presumably, right? Well, right now, the clinics that I'm aware of, most of the clinics have paused IVF treatment. We've also learned that one of the largest transporters of frozen embryos is no longer doing service to and from Alabama. So that probably is li limiting people's ability to move their embryos. And, you know, there could be reluctance on the part of clinics to, to release the embryos in case they're the ones that could be held liable. So I don't have direct information on whether embryos are, are being moved out of the state, but certainly embryo transfers for the most part are not being conducted in Alabama. And this is impacting patients and providers, you know, very directly. You know, full disclosure, I, I, we use IVF rather for my second, second kid. And 
to have your, your treatment stop, you know, mid-treatment when you're going through IVF is devastating. Time is of the essence from month to month. You have no idea what your body's going to do. You have no idea. I mean, you could have a few months, a few weeks to work with, with these embryos. You just don't know. So to have any disruptions, right? Even if a doctor cancels your appointment, that could be a really big deal. And I just want people to really understand the emotional roller coaster that people are going through with this decision. Exactly. It's devastating. And as you know, it takes weeks and weeks of preparation, taking the right medications, doing injections to get your body ready to accept that embryo, to give the best chance at pregnancy, and everything comes to a grinding halt. And we have just heard from scores of patients who are scared, sad, overwhelmed, angry, you know, they're losing hope. Uh, One patient told us this ripped all all hope out of us. Will we ever be able to have a child? It's, It's heartbreaking. And it's equally heartbreaking for the physicians who've been on calls with these patients canceling their cycles. And both parties are in tears. You know, right after the Dobbs decision, anti-abortion or abortion ban legislation just spread across the country like wildfire immediately all across the country within days really i kind of expected the same thing to happen after this decision but i don't think that's quite happened yet i mean granted it's only been i think it's been less than two weeks it it hasn't happened yet and i'm not really sure why i know that people are devastated but in terms of the, the the politicians who are behind this decision conservatives rather They've been kind of backtracking, I think, because I don't think they expected there to be such a backlash, right? I mean, so what's been happening in in that sense? Yeah, I think you're right. Well, first of all, I think lawmakers and perhaps a lot of the general public don't realize that infertility impacts a lot of people. In fact, it impacts one in six people globally. And there's also been polling showing that more than 85% of Americans support IVF and family building through IVF. So I think that lawmakers are realizing that their constituents really care about this issue and they need to decide what side they're going to be on. Are they going to help their constituents build their families or are they going to dash their dreams of a family right this has been turned into a political issue but you know infertility it doesn't pick a party right you're no it it is (laughs) it is non-partisan it does not discriminate by party or political beliefs right it's true (laughs) so do you know or do we know rather how many uh, babies are born via IVF every year? So two of every hundred babies in the U.S. are born using assisted reproductive technology such as IVF. Two out of every hundred babies. That's a lot. So that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. What is that? Like, I don't know. I, I saw a number somewhere about a million over a million I believe so. And there are certainly since the beginning of IVF, there are more than 8 million in the U.S. And of course, you know, that's over a 40 year period. And obviously success rates have improved. So I believe I've seen that million estimate as well. I think one of the things that I learned from my own experience with IVF is that we were talking about all the scenarios that could happen that are putting families and their dreams of having a family at risk. Um, one of the things that I experienced was the storage, right? Storage is very expensive, right? That's one thing that people don't really account for. So let's say you go through IVF and you have some embryos left over, you have to pay for those frozen emb- embryos to remain in storage. And that can get expensive, right? And a lot of families, if they're done having children, they don't want to pay that expense. I mean, this is a decision that, that my husband and myself went through ourselves. So if you're in a state, let's say like Alabama, and you just decide, you know, I don't want to pay anymore. Or let's say your credit card expires. <laughs> you know, that are you, I know this is silly, but maybe it's not silly. Are you going to be charged with, you know, wrongful death? 
Well, that's a scenario of people being forced to pay to store their frozen embryos indefinitely. So that could be quite a considerable expense. And you're right. What happens if they do stop paying? And gosh, now are you having to put the storage of embryos in your estate planning? It, it just, the, 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 yes, again, just so many questions that I don't think uh, anyone anticipated when you now equate frozen embryos with living children. It just, you know, raises all sorts of what sound like nonsensical questions that we're trying to answer. I know that Resolve is watching what's happening in other states around this, and I, I'm hoping you can give me kind of a big picture of what's happening, but there are some other states to watch. I know that Tennessee made an attempt to do something similar to Alabama that failed. It didn't go through. So what are some states that we should be watching that we should be worried about in relation to IVF? Well, Resolve has been battling personhood since 2008, believe it or not you know, where for people are stating that fertilization, uh, that life begins at fertilization. And so these fertilized eggs are now considered people with legal rights, but we've been able to successfully defeat those bills primarily by reaching out to lawmakers in those states and explaining that, you know, you're target may be to attack abortion, but did you realize that, that this will also impact people who are trying to have a baby? And normally, and typically they didn't realize that. And so they backed off or the legislation didn't go anywhere. And then we also always had the backdrop of Roe v. Wade. And so now there isn't that backdrop. And so the concern is that um, more states will pass this personhood legislation that could become problematic for the standard of care for IVF. So states like Oklahoma and Idaho and Missouri and Florida and Texas. So, you know, we're watching those states carefully, although I think they're probably watching Alabama carefully and realizing that perhaps this is going too far. Yeah. I mean, I don't have a lot of hope in Al with Alabama because even though their legislature did try to counter this with a decision, I don't know the specifics of the decision, but they were trying to protect clinics from lawsuits, but they did not go as far as saying, well, embryos are not babies. Right. So, right. The yeah. current bills that are actually going to be heard again tomorrow are really just a band-aid to try to reopen clinics. But the longer term question of how to classify embryos as still needs to be resolved because there are still too many factors that could, again, interfere with patients receiving the standard of care and providers providing the standard of care and, you know, but facing potential uh, litigation and, and, you know, civil or criminal charges. Right. So you open up an interesting question. So let's say that that's successful with the Alabama legislature and they're able to protect clinics and then they can open up again and they can continue IBF, you know, treatments because they aren't open to lawsuits. Then, so what, <laughs> what's then gained from all of this? We're kind of back at square one, except embryos are classified as, as people. Well, I think the lawmakers do understand that there is more work to do, that this is not solving the, the bigger picture. There's some dissonance when you're passing legislation that says you have immunity for the death and destruction of an embryo if they truly consider that embryo as an unborn child, that continued to be the only 
legislation that's on the books because there's already some already confusion and the potential for misinterpretation. And so it's not enough. It may get the clinics opened for the time being, but lawmakers need to keep working on legislation that actually allows the standard of care of IVF to continue to be performed in Alabama. I guess what I'm trying to say is if the clinics are opened again and they're performing IVF treatments, right? The only thing that's left out of this decision is that you've declared embryos as people. Personhood, right, has been granted to embryos. And that's the only thing that's left, which which is the most dangerous part. Well, the legislation doesn't do that. There was a legal ruling in a civil case. So that is separate. So there isn't... uh, a law stating that, or at least my understanding is that there's not a separate law stating that embryos are the same as unborn children. And I'm not a lawyer, so I should caveat it that way. But the the ruling was for a civil lawsuit. And now lawmakers are trying to provide a legislative solution. I see. I see. Thank you for clarifying that. So are you mobilizing women in those states to talk to their state legislatures about their states being at risk for something like this? How are women responding? Yeah, right. Well, the women are already responding without any urging from us. So they have been submitting their stories through our Fight for Families campaign because they fear that their states could be next. And so with advocacy, especially related to infertility, sharing your story is the most important thing you can do. As I said earlier, most people don't realize how common infertility is. And part of that is because not enough people are talking about it. There's still a a stigma associated with infertility. It's a very private matter having to do with, you know, sexual reproduction. And so not enough people are talking about it. Well, now is the time for people to be talking about it and sharing their stories and the challenges they face building a family and making sure that their lawmakers are protecting their right to build a family and protect and protecting IVF. That's a really good point. There's kind of a a shame, and I guess that's rooted in a lot of different things, sexism, misogyny. And I think that if we kind of made it okay to talk about that openly, more women would probably seek it. I know one of the statistics that I read was that Black and Latino women have greater numbers of infertility in comparison to white women, but they seek infertility treatments less often, right? And I think it's, it's part of the stigma of talking about it openly. Right. Exactly. I think uh, the stigma may be stronger in certain communities, um, or perhaps it's the opposite of the stereotype of being fertile, and it just creates some additional barriers to seeking care. But, you know, infertility is a disease, and I can't think of any other disease where a state is somehow limiting how you can deliver the standard of care, how they're legislating medical care for a disease. Especially citing Bible verses, which is... (laughs) That too. (laughs) (laughs) Right. But I know that some states are doing some positive things on your map, right? They're trying to protect fertility treatments and IVF. Is that true? And what states are doing that? Yes. Well, some states have protected IVF at the same time that they were trying to codify, you know, protecting abortion and contraception states like Illinois and New York, I believe. And, you know, other states are passing insurance legislation to improve 
access to IVF because we know that out-of-pocket costs when insurance doesn't cover infertility, that these out-of-pocket costs are the biggest barrier to care. So I've probably said access a lot, but really what's happening in, in Alabama is about having IVF be legally available, but in other states, it's legally available, but it's not accessible because people can't afford it without insurance coverage. So there are uh, about 21 states with some sort of fertility insurance law. Not all of them cover IVF, but we're working in a number of states right now to pass this insurance legislation. And we're actually seeing what's happening happening in Alabama is providing an additional incentive to get this done. Yeah, well, insurance companies right now in America, they typically go through private companies, right? Companies offer insurance to their employers. Is there an avenue there through companies to provide IVF coverage as a benefit to their employers, right? And then, you know, you'll have more people supporting it then if it's covered through a company. Is that an avenue? Absolutely. And honestly, I believe the private sector is sort of leading the way. They don't need to wait for a state legislation to require coverage. Actually, most people work for self-insured employers. So these are the very large employers, 500 or more employees who are actually governed by federal law, not state law. So these companies and employers can voluntarily add these benefits. And Resolve has an entire program called Coverage at Work that helps employees make the ask to their HR departments to add these pro-family benefits. And there's actually a study by Mercer showing that virtually all of these employers, 97% that provide fertility benefits, including IVF, have not seen a significant increase in their medical costs. So it's good for business. It's not only the right thing to do, it's good for business and helping attract and retain top employees, top talent. And we know employees value this benefit and will leave a job in order to find one that provides this coverage. What is the program called again? Coverage at Work. And okay. people can access it at resolve.org slash coverage at work. We have templates you can use to reach out to HR and we have all the supporting data, uh, some of which I've uh, alluded to that you can have right at your fingertips and, and share with HR. And since we started this program, Several years ago, over 3 million employees now have better family building benefits as a result of a coverage at work ask. That's amazing. Betsy, I'm sorry. That's amazing. I mean, I, again, full disclosure, I, I did go through IVF and the only way I was able to, to afford it was because it was covered through the yes. company. Yeah, that was the only way. That's wonderful. And I bet you were very loyal to that company <laughs> and very grateful for that benefit. Yes, 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 we were. So at the federal level, how do you foresee this, assuming we're going to go into a positive direction, and I believe that we are, how do you see this happening on a national level, like federal mm -hmm. protection for fertility coverage? Well, a federal bill actually existed prior to Alabama is and is more important than ever. It's called the Access to Family Building Act. It's been introduced by Senator uh, Duckworth and Congresswoman Wild, and it basically uh, guarantees the legal right to access IVF and other infertility care for all Americans, regardless of where you live. So we are encouraging everyone to reach out to their federal lawmakers, to their representatives and senators, and encouraging them to support the Access to Family Building Act. I just think, you know, the dream of creating a family shouldn't depend on where a person lives. And so it's important that 
people not only reach out to their federal lawmakers, but also their state lawmakers to make sure that they are not passing laws that interfere with family building and in fact are passing legislation that protects family building and fighting for families rather than against them. Yeah, that's an excellent point. It, it, where you live shouldn't determine that. Wow. But Betsy Campbell, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed our conversation and thank you for sharing all of the resources and I'll put those in the show notes so that people can find you. I so appreciate that. Thank you so much.